I want to introduce tonight's speaker, Craig Benner. Craig is a native Pennsylvanian who grew up in Lancaster County and has had a varied career, including working 18 years in the specialty uh, photographic retail business and as a German teacher. Craig's love of history began as a teen at the Ephrata Cloister, where he has volunteered since 1972 and also served as a PHMC summer seasonal there for three summers. During those summers, he served as a team member on the archaeological field team and also photographed all the artifacts in the collection. Craig has been a guide at the Railroad Museum of Pennsylvania uh, in Strasburg since 2009 after spending five years at Landis Valley Museum and uh, as a, a seasonal employee at, here at Cornwall Iron Furnace. Please welcome our speaker, Craig Benner. Craig. Thank you, Michael. And I might, met Mike, speaking of historic sites at Daniel Boone Homestead. Pretty sure that's where we met. Yes, it was. Um, I am a Pennsylvania native, and uh, just to give you an idea, I was born in Philadelphia before there was a crack in the Liberty Bell, so that ought to tell you something. I don't even know when that was. Um, this talk actually started out, I, I have been involved with history, mostly as a volunteer and as a serious person interested. I like going to museums, I like going to historic sites, I like learning about how people lived in, in the olden days, shall we say. And, one of the things that I always try to figure out, or at least try to figure out, one of the things when you deal with history is we have the glasses of 2020 and our own life that we look through. And it's like, they didn't have those things. And what did they think about? What did they do? And that's one of the things I try to start to think about. And one of the things I find interesting, and this talk actually started out a couple of years ago at work, since we were talking so much about trains, I thought we'd maybe try to do something and look at other forms of transportation and some other things. Uh, as you see in the title, uh, Mike didn't have that part, but it says, and other stuff. And really, uh, I could go on with the other stuff forever. And we have time limitation here. So I was really struggling to cut out everything I wanted to say in this talk. So I hope what's left is something that you will enjoy. Uh, as it says on the slide, uh, roads, trains, canals, and other stuff. This bill here is a $10 Berks County bill that Mike uh, Emery uh, gave me this image from, he scanned it. And I just loved it when I saw it, I said, I gotta use it because if you look in the back here, now I don't know what, we, he wasn't sure what the bill date was, but if you look in the back here, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but th that, that locomotive there is uh, Berks County. Heck, they had trains there with Reading Railroad, not, not necessarily, but that's definitely in like an 1840s era locomotive, maybe somewhere on that. And then we have a, a canal boat here, a barge, and look at the people farming. I mean, this is definitely Pennsylvania. Now, as I said, I am um, a native Pennsylvanian, and Pennsylvania is known for a lot of things. We like to eat, but as far as industry and other things, Pennsylvania is known for lumber. And if you know what Pennsylvania mean, it means Penn's woods. And uh, I have trouble imagining how much forest there was in Pennsylvania. We have one story from the effort of Cloister that the park-like atmosphere that it has today is beautiful, but there's a story of a guy that came to visit them and the trees were so thick, he got lost. And he was yelling into the, into the trees, trying to find someone, and finally somebody came and helped him out. And uh, I read one account that it, they said that Americans on their properties chopped down all their wood. And if you happen to live next to a railroad, one of the things you could do, chop down your trees, cut up the wood, set it next to the track, and the train would stop and fill the tender with wood and then they would leave a chit on your pile of wood that you could then get reimbursed for money. So lumber has been a big thing. And in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, I work for the Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Commission. We have a lot of museums and, and one of the really cool ones is the Pennsylvania Lumber Museum in Potter County. And uh, we went here, you can see it's a small picture, but that's a brand new building. It's a testimony to the, the creativity of our organization to pull off a building like that. Plus it smells darn good. We are also, of course, known for iron and steel. Heck, we have a football team named after steel, and I don't know if you like beer or if you can call it that, but Iron City Beer, steel and iron, a big deal. And speaking of Pennsylvania and making steel, iron, steel was very difficult to make. It was very expensive, and there was a guy named William Kelly from Pittsburgh, and uh, he, he will develop a process. Same time, a guy in Europe named Bessemer creates it, he gets the patent in first and gets all the rights to it. But we were at a museum in Johnstown and they had a movie of all things about the Bessemer process. And I said, Sue, do you want my wife, said to my wife, do you want to watch this? And she said, okay, well, 
it was such a good movie when we came out. She said, that was really great. So that says a lot. She found that. Well, if you want to learn about iron, you can't go any place better than the Cornwall Iron Furnace. This is a place that's easy to miss, but well worth the trip. So hopefully you can get there sometime. Pennsylvania is also known for oil. And you know, growing up in Pennsylvania, I didn't really realize, but look at all the names here. That Quaker State, Penn's Oil. I never realized, but you know, in 1859, what starts in Titusville, Pennsylvania, but the modern oil industry as we know it. And right up there in Titusville, we have Drakewell Park. Also an absolutely amazing museum. There was a period of time, I think, and I don't know when it was, in the 70s that the PHMC had what we call a, I call, and we jokingly call a, a prison style of architecture, and the, their building looks like that, but it's worth it to go there, and what's inside is absolutely amazing. And they actually have the Drake Well uh, building that you see in that picture on the left there. And we are known for coal, and it is indeed coal that will cause many of the railroads to have huge fortunes, People uh, like Asa Packer, who will found Lehigh uh, University, from his millions and millions of dollars, he funds his school. The first 20 years, you could go for free. Uh, we are one of the world's largest sources of anthracite coal, and although many railroads won't burn anthracite, it was used for heating and for industrial purposes. And we also have an anthracite museum in Scranton. And there you can see an example of that prison architecture that I was just joking about. Of course, Pennsylvania is also known for railroads, and if we're talking about transportation, we'll talk about railroading. And if, one of the things I found interesting is this old circle here where it says Standard Railroad of America. Pennsylvania Railroad started in 1846, and within 50 years, it's like this huge, gigantic, mega organization. It's one of the largest corporations in the world. So they, they say, we are the Standard Railroad of America. And within about 10 years or so, they, they build a tunnel under the Hudson River. They go to New York City, to Manhattan, and build a Monument, monumental station, and then they change it to Standard Railroad of the World. And of course, where I work, hopefully you'll get there someday, is the Railroad Museum of Pennsylvania. All right, all that to say that Pennsylvania had all the raw materials to produce whatever it needed regarding the realm of transportation. It is also a state that's a place of rich and diverse culture, industry, and natural resources, and it really has a history that should be studied and explored. I'm off the soapbox now, that was the commercial. I think Mike might give you a, a, an opportunity at the end to donate, and I hope you do. In any case, I have some interesting pictures here. Um, I was playing an overview of a number of things, and I discovered along the way that I discovered along the way that I found interesting. And I am by no means an expert. I have a BA in German. I do not have a degree in history. I never took a, an American history course in college. Uh, I've learned everything I've learned by talking to people and reading and going to places. So. If you have any questions about the fine points of canals, I may not be your man, but I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about canals tonight and some other things as well as uh, um, that. But I found an uh, interesting excerpt from Connor Prairie. Maybe you've been there or heard of it, but they had a little bit of, of, about uh, trans moving, okay, transportation. In the early 19th century, as the number of Western migrants increased, the small trails could not accommodate the heavy traffic, nor did the existing modes of transportation facilitate quick and easy access to the nation's interior. For the people, inadequate transportation was more of a stumbling block, I find that amazing, just a stumbling block, than an actual hindrance to the settling of Western territories. For the nation, however, the absence of good transportation prevented its ability to transport goods and produce from the interior to Eastern markets at reasonable cost. And just one small example that I found, in 1860, you could ship one ton of goods from Europe to the United States for $9, but for $9, you could ship a, a ton of goods just 30 miles over land. So yeah, it was very expensive, okay? So the Connor Prairie it continues to respond to its serious needs. America embarked upon a course of internal improvements and technological developments labeled by historian George Robert Taylor as the transportation revolution. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but I thought we should at least talk about ships, of course, Everybody that came to the colonies came by ship, and many people that had business reasons or education would also travel by ship. It took six to eight weeks to cross the Atlantic Ocean, and you know, if you did travel that long, you're not gonna just go for a week, you're gonna stay for a month or, or maybe even years uh, before you come back home. Um, and if you wanted to travel from north to south in the colonies, it was the easiest way to travel along the coast, or if you needed to go to the West Indies, of course. And there were very few merchant ships who would not take on passengers. I don't know how comfortable it was. 
I found this ad and look in snooping around on, on, online. It's an ad from County Cork, Ireland, which I think is interesting. And they're publishing an ad for their trip to Philadelphia on a, 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 a boat called the Snow Pen. Not sure what that means. But uh, I won't read the whole thing. But number one, it is heading to the flourishing city of Philadelphia. Now, this is 1773. And Philadelphia, as the ad says, was well known to be the most healthy and the cheapest place in all America. All young men and young women, keep in mind young women, who have a mind to better their fortunes will meet with proper encouragement to travel with us. I think that's amazing. All right, if you talk about early American traveling and roads and things like that, we got to talk about horses. Of course, horses were used in agriculture and maybe oxen were more common. But when we think about getting around in the early days, we must, of course, mention the noble horse. Uh, horses ranged from one source that I found in colonial America, get this, from five pounds to a thousand pounds. Holy Toledo. Now, one place I found indicated that the 13 colony average income per capita in 1774 was 15 pounds, six shillings, or whatever that means. And so if you made that much in a year, you might be able to afford that five pound horse, but keep in mind, you also have to provide maintenance for that horse as well. And you know, if you think about it today, depending on how much money you make, how much is that car, that new car you want to buy compared to your average annual salary? So it's just interesting how some things stay the same. And I don't know really how many people had horses, but last week Michael Showater said in his talk that he found in tax records for Lancaster County, and I think it was the ha every household in Lancaster County had an average of two to three horses, either for every household or for every farm. Now, just to make things simple, we're going to talk a little bit about horses in Philadelphia. They did play a critical role in Philadelphia's growth uh, and develop as an industrial in development as an industrial city. And although horses have become associated with the countryside or the American West, American cities had large concentrated populations of horses well into the 20th century, especially in the Northeast. If a banker was in 19th century Philadelphia, he would see more horses than a cowboy would in Montana. Think about that. Philadelphia was a compact pre-industrial walking city the wealthy, of course, of course, had horses for riding, carriage travel, and sport. But most people walked where they needed to go and hauled goods in hand carts and ox carts. Horses made the cities work, providing the circulation of people and goods within the city. In 1858, Philadelphia introduced the horse-drawn streetcar. They will be used until 1897 when electricity takes over. Horse-drawn streetcars expanded Philadelphia's residential area and suburbs carrying 222 million passengers on 429 miles of track by the 1880s. Streetcar companies owned more than 5,000 horses, which lived in large multi-story stables akin to a modern parking garage. Kind of interesting. Horse-drawn traffic, single horse drays, huge multi-horse wagons, carriages and cabs filled the streets. Horses worked in construction, shipping, manufacturing, excavating, and power cranes and equipment hauling those things, and also, of course, in agriculture. By 1900, Philadelphia had 400 horses per square mile, or nearly 50,000 horses overall. Now, one final thought about the horses, and this is a very practical thing, but horses affected the urban environment by adding four to 10 tons of manure and hundreds of gallon of urine to the streets each day. And this, of course, created some health issues. Now, we all like to moan about the mail service, but in early colonial times, the correspondence depended on friends, merchants, and Native Americans to carry messages among the colonies. However, most correspondence ran between the colonists and their mother countries. It was largely to handle this mail that in 1639, the first official notice of mail service in the colonies appeared. Now the Boston Post Road, as with so many roads, was originally an Indian trail and it was first used by lone postal riders going from Boston to New York in early 1673. This road was actually authorized by King Charles II. The round trip from Boston to New York took one month. Of course, they had to stop in each tavern in each town. Uh, then in 1723, they'll add a stagecoach route. Just for comparison today, this route is about 230 miles long and a round trip without stops would take less than eight hours. Now in 1767, Benjamin Franklin was postmaster general and 
he had stone markers installed along the road between Boston and New York. And when he left office in 1774, because he was one of those radical revolutionaries, coastal roads operated from Maine to Florida and from New York to Canada. Now, after listening to Michael Showater last week, I think there were a lot of what were called King's Highways, and they will be known by a variety of names. And in as early as 1700, the Pennsylvania legislator authorized, authorized the building of King's Highways at the colony's expense, and they were to be 50 feet wide. The first, completed in 1706, connected Philadelphia and Chester, which I think it's the blue route on my Google map there on the lower right. And the second, which is now basically Route 611, built in 1711, went north from Philadelphia to New Hope and was extended to Easton in 1722. One local King's Highway that went by a variety of names, including the Paxtang or the Paxton Road, is our current Route 322 in my hometown of Ephrata. There's actually one of the markers. All right, here's a road that's fairly famous if you've studied American history. November 1753, a 21-year-old George Washington first traveled an old Native American path over the rugged Appalachian Mountains. It was called, I'm going to say, Nima Colon. I don't know how to pronounce it. Uh, Nima Colon's path after the Indian who first blazed the trail. It began at the site of present-day Cumberland, Maryland, and ended at what we know as Pittsburgh. Washington made the journey as a British emissary to tell the French to get out, and they sent him back to uh, Virginia with his tail between his legs. The road was renamed Braddock's Road in honor of British General Je Edward Braddock in 1755. He led a costly expedition against the French Fort Duquesne at the Forks of the Ohio, and General Braddock widened the path with 600 troops into a 110-mile road for his army of siege guns, field pieces, 200 wagons, and 2,200 troops. It was an epic maneuver in a summer plagued by heat and drought. All right, another famous road, particularly in Pennsylvania, is, of course, Forbes Road. It's involved, of course, with the French and Indian in the Seven Years' War. Uh, the Forbes Road stretched about 200 miles, as you can see on the map, from Carlisle to the Forks of the Ohio again, which Fort Duquesne, we know, is Pittsburgh. Um, it was named after General John Forbes, the commander of the 1758 British expedition that built it. Along with Braddock's Road, the Forbes Road was one of the two great western land routes that the British cut through the Mid-Atlantic backcountry during the Seven Years' War. And the Forbes Road proved to be one of the most enduring legacies of the Seven Years' War for Pennsylvania. It made communication and trade easier between the eastern and western portions of the colony and provided an important route west, route west for settlers going to the Ohio country. Today, anyone who has traveled the Pennsylvania Turnpike between Harrisburg and Pittsburgh has followed the footsteps of Ford's army. Okay, so roads are a big deal. They're very expensive. We have no idea how bad roads were and how impassable they were at some times. But in any case, we're going to take a look at two very famous roads as well as what we've looked at already. And one was a local effort and the other was a national effort. And these roads are called turnpikes. And I think we all know what a turnpike is. They're basically toll roads, turnpike. It's like a pole across the road and you lift it or turn it out of the way and after you pay your toll. Well, you know, you get the idea. But we have a turnpike era. The first petition for a more permanent road from Philadelphia to Lancaster was in 1730, but the legislature did not pass a bill for the purpose until 62 years later in 1792. And you know what? They weren't going to pay for it either. So the Philadelphia and Lancaster Turnpike Company commissioners opened a subscription for stock shares. The stock soon proved so popular that one observer coined the prophetic phrase, turnpike rage. We might think of that as something different today. And this was to describe the frantic demand for shares. Everything is now turned to speculation, he said. The quiet Quakers who attended for the purpose of joining in the subscription and encouraging the road, finding such an uproar, withdrew. There were similar disorders at Lancaster, and in the end, shares had to be allocated by lottery to would-be surprise subscribers. People must have had a lot of money in their mattresses. So the road was completed in 1794. And it was a monumental and innovative achievement, and it was actually one of the first truly engineered roads. It was paved with stone the whole way and overlaid with gravel. And the 62-mile turnpike cost more than $450,000 at that time. And there's actually sites that you can go to and try to convert that, and that's about 
six and a half million today. That doesn't sound like a lot to build a highway, but in that day it was a staggering sum. Now, they will appear earlier than the Pennsylvania, Lancaster, Philadelphia Lancaster Turnpike, but one of the common sites was this distinctive horse-drawn freight wagon known as the Conestoga wagon. And they can be traced to the Conestoga River region of Pennsylvania's Lancaster County, uh, right where we are in the middle to the late 18th century. I think first reference to a Conestoga wagon is as early as 1717, I don't remember, but it's, it's pretty early. They were known for their distinctive curved floors and canvas covers arched over wooden hoops. They became a common sight. They were the big rigs of their days and could carry up to six tons of freight. There were often trains of up to 30 wagons on the turnpikes and they yielded to no one. One account indicates that there were upwards of 1,000 Conestoga wagons that traveled the turnpike each day. I find that ama amazing. And they traveled carrying apples and bacon, beef and beer, biscuits and butter, cheese, cider, corn, wheat, flour, leather, lumber, pork, whiskey, furs, and many other products of Pennsylvania goodness. Besides transporting goods, they also served General Braddock during the French and Indian War, and they also served in the Revolutionary War. And I'm not sure if Mike could tell us, but I think they were used to transport cannon. I'm not sure, maybe even from Cornwall Iron Furnace, but that's another story. Now some facts about them. The reason the base of the, the, the bed of the wagon is curved was to try to prevent the loads from shifting so it didn't have the typical flatbed. They made the bed longer, up to 16 feet to allow for more goods. And they also expanded the width of the bed. They added a white hemp, canvas, or linen cover stretched across large wooden bows. It was 11 feet at the beginning, at the front and the back, as you can see the way it, it sticks up there. They used special durable woods to make the axles and the hubs. The wheels were made larger so that they would have Im improved ride and help with fording streams and rivers. Blacksmiths forged iron rims for the wheels as well as other hardware. And while you can't see it in these pictures here, there was something called a, a sideboard, a lazy board that they would pull out on the side of the wagon. The driver didn't drive or ride in the wagon. He would either walk beside the rear horse, or as you can see there, he would ride on the rear saddle horse. And he would, often had a whip. It was a very special whip. And somewhere when we needed three cent postage stamps, the Postal Service saw fit to put one on a stamp. Now, Conestoga wagoners also became a power in Pennsylvania politics. And in 1835, they helped elect Joseph Rittner, governor of Pennsylvania. He was known as the wagon boy of the Alleghenies. He had worked as a wagoner in his youth. They also did their best to hold back public funding of railroads, which they argued would drive up taxes, force blacksmiths, wheelwrights, and other tradesmen out of business, and worst of all, stimulate the immigration of Irishmen by the loads and ruin us poor wagoners. Just a side note, in 1800, Pennsylvania and New York are the most populous free states in the nation. Philadelphia and New York were the nation's largest cities. And basically, in this beginning of the 19th century, a trade competition will begin to see who will come out on top. And basically, this is between Philadelphia, Baltimore, and New York. In the next three decades, the Commonwealth chartered 200 turnpike companies, which built 3,000 miles of road. Again, by that time, we'll have some competition from canals and railroads. We can see our turnpike heritage in Lancaster County, if you just drive around. The Oregon Pike was chartered in 1850. Before that, this road existed from Lancaster to points north, and it was called the Catfish Pike. Oregon was renamed when they got a post office. Uh, the Lancaster and Lidditz Turnpike, which we simply know as the Lidditz Pike today, was chartered in 1838, Route 501. And what we know is the Mannheim Pike, uh, the Mannheim, Petersburg, and Lancaster Turnpike, 1850, Route 72. Now here's the national road that the government decided to pay for. It's also known as the Cumberland Road and is also known today as Route 40. And construction west began from Cumberland, Maryland. Uh, in 1811 and reached Wheeling, West Virginia on the Ohio River seven years later. That's about 20 miles a year. It was the first federally funded road in U.S. history. Both George Washington and Thomas Jefferson were on board with a Trans-Appalachian Road, and they thought it was necessary for unifying the young, young country. And in 1806, Congress authorized construction of the road. Um, it'll take a while to finish the road will eventually earn the nickname Main Street of America. 
And as you can see on the map, by uh, the 1850s, it'll reach Vandalia, Ohio. Something that I find interesting and had never heard of before was something called a plank road. And they were described as incredibly fast and smooth. And there was an expression 240 on the plank road. And what that referred to was 240, two minutes and 40 seconds, as a fast trotting speed for a horse that you could do a mile in two minutes and 40 seconds. And this was a high standard that only the best horses could meet. And it's like they were talking about that like we might talk about a human runner doing a four minute mile. Outside of a racetrack, the best chance of doing it was on the best possible service, surface. And when plank roads were first built, they were so smooth, they were just too enticing not to try to show off your horse's best speed. Plank roads were made of boards. And as long as they were properly maintained, provided a smooth surface, they were constructed of laying planks of pine or oak eight to 16 feet long and three to four inches thick across sleepers or stringers, which were placed parallel to the direction of the road. The ditches were dug on either side of the road to provide proper drainage. And uh, there were a lot of these turnpikes that we were talking about earlier that, that had plank roads as part of the turnpikes, even the one effort a turnpike. And, I was uh, doing some research on the electrification of the Pennsylvania Railroad and was looking at a map of the northern New Jersey where the tunnel is that goes into the Hudson River Tunnel and said Patterson Plank Road. Now that was in 1910, so the name persisted. I don't know if it's still there or not. All right, let's move on to the Canal Age, 1790 to 1855. Uh, in the United States, canal building began slowly. Only 100 miles of canals had been built at the beginning of the 19th century. But before the end of the century, more than 4,000 miles were open to navigation. In total, Pennsylvania had 1,200 miles of hand-dug canals with the Union Canal, which you can see I've highlighted that with in red there between Reading and Middletown, um, ranking in the top three for importance, and it contributed greatly to the development of our country. Now, the Union Canal was a towpath canal that existed in southeastern Pennsylvania in the United States during the 19th century first proposed by William Penn in 1690 to connect Philadelphia with the Susquehanna River, obviously via the Schuylkill River. It ran approximately 80, 82 miles, as I said, from Middletown on the Susquehanna below Harrisburg to Reading on the Schuylkill River. The Union Canal, just on a side interesting note, was the first canal ever formally surveyed in the United States. That was first chartered in 1792, and they did build several miles of canal between Myerstown and Lebanon before financial difficulties caused the work to cease. And apparently in this time period, our dear George Washington visited. I don't know where he slept though. The state legislature granted permission, since they ran out of money, and they weren't gonna fork up any money, to raise 400,000 by lottery in 1795. So now we have another lottery, like a rage. Um, in two decades and 50 lottery drawings, $33 million was awarded in prize money, but only $270,000 ever reached the coffers of the Union Canal Company. This was the largest canal lottery in the nation's history. And it was reorganized in 1811 as the Union Canal Company. And it was finally opened as they worked, began work in 1821 and, and opened in 1828. Now I've been here, maybe you have too. I know Mike has been there, but when it was finally opened, the canal was called the Golden Link because it was at Link Philadelphia to the Susquehanna, provided a critical early transportation route for shipping anthracite coal and lumber eastward to Philadelphia. It was closed in the 1880s and there's still remnants of the canal that remain, most notably the Union Canal Tunnel. It was a hand-built engineering marvel that is the oldest existing transportation tunnel in the United States. Pretty cool. It is a National Historic Landmark and there's a nice park there. Now we're going to switch to the mother of all canals and uh, in this time period anyway. And while it's not a Pennsylvania canal, it will certainly affect Pennsylvania and the rest of the nation. The Erie Canal runs from Albany on the Hudson, over to the right there on the east, to Lake Erie, at Buffalo at Lake Erie there. Construction had begun in 1817. After unsuccessfully seeking federal government assistance, huh, where have we heard that before, DeWitt Clinton successfully petitioned the New York State Legislature to build the canal and bring that dream to reality. Clinton's ditch is what his critics called it. 
And the canal spanned 350 miles between the Great Lakes and Hudson River, as I said. The effect of the canal was both immediate and dramatic, and settlers poured west. An explosion of trade began, spurred by freight rates from Buffalo to New York of $10 per ton by canal, compared to $100 by ton by road. Pennsylvanians were shocked after the canal was finished to find that the cheapest route for them to get to Pittsburgh, now this is in 1825, keep in mind, was to go up to New York City, up the Hudson River, across New York by the Erie Canal to the Great Lakes with a short overland trip to Pittsburgh. When it became evident that little help for state improvements could be expected from the federal government, other states followed New York in constructing canals. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Now, in 18, by 1830, New York City had become the principal gateway to the West and the financial center for the nation, which was like a thorn in our side here in Pennsylvania. It surpassed both Philadelphia and Baltimore as a center of population and commerce. Now, to, to bear this out, sometime around maybe 30 years later, I read a story about a Pennsylvania Railroad employee. I think he went out to Chicago. And that bill that we had at the beginning here was a Berks County bill. And the thing that's interesting is that places printed their own money. So here's this Pennsylvania guy working for the Pennsylvania Railroad. He's out in Chicago, and they won't take his money from Pennsylvania. As a matter of fact, nobody that he talks to in Chicago knows anything about Philadelphia. In the hotel, where are all the newspapers from? Certainly not Philadelphia, but New York City. And it just makes sense, the influence that New York had. In 1825, DeWitt Clinton, who was the governor, he'll only live another three years, so he's going to miss a lot of fun. Uh, he's uh, actually uh, off the coast of New Jersey, and he it looks like a bucket there, but he basically dumps a barrel of water from the Erie, Lake Erie into the Atlantic Ocean as a signification of the, uh, the joining of those two bodies of water. All right, let's switch to steam power. How's your French? Fadier à vapeur. Anyway, this guy is Nicolas Joseph Cugnot, I would say is how you pronounce it. I just find this fascinating. So this is in the late 1760s, keep in mind. And he experimented with steam power, trying to develop a vehicle for the French military under Napoleon, but his vehicle had no brakes, just like early steam locomotives. So his invention, you can actually see this invention on display at the Musée des Arts et Métiers in Paris. Officially, as I said, it was a fardier à vapeur, or a steam-powered dray. A dray was normally a horse cart, the two-wheeled variety, and Cugnot's version would have, two, ha, would have two wheels plus a third in the front to replace the horse, and you can see the three wheels there. French general wanted Cugnot to design a fardier that could carry the heavy cannons of the day, and the good general wanted and didn't want much. He wanted the fardier to travel about two and a half miles an hour, which actually, considering that the fastest horse's carriage went zero miles per hour. This vehicle wasn't perfect, far from it, but it moved without a horse for 10 to 15 minutes at a time. Then you need to put more water in it and let it boil to build up some more steam. 1771, as you can see in the picture there, he drove it into a wall. And basically because the French weren't fighting any wars and no one cared, that's the last we see of it, but it won't be the last of steam power. Now we should mention a guy named Newcomen who much before Watt develops a steam pump. Keep in mind, these pumps are basically used to pump out water in mines, big industry in England and Southern England in particular. Also, if you had a mill and the water was low, you could pump up water to the mill. But any kind, by the time of Watt's birth, these new common engines were pumping water from mines all over the country. And in around 1764, Watt was given a model of a new common engine to repair. He looked at it and he realized it was hopefully inefficient, and began to work to improve the design. He designed with a separate condensing chamber and he patented it in 1769 after making other improvements. The Watt steam engine was a key point in the Industrial Revolution, was the first designed to use a separate condenser, and he avoided using high pressure steam because of safety concerns. But Watt's design became synonymous with steam engines. All right, let's carry this to the transportation now. 1787, we see here actually in 1786, John Fitch's steamboat. Now you've probably all heard of John Fitch, but there's another guy that's much more famous than him. He, uh, his, wind boat, his uh, 
steamboat is passing Windmill Island, which I looked on the map doesn't exist anymore, on the Philadelphia waterfront behind. This is the Delaware River. It also shows Fitch's original design for a steamboat, which utilized a bank of oars on either side of the vessel. Before his death in 1798, he built four mechanically successful steamboats, and these were the first in the United States, and although mechanically successful, his steamboats were financial failures. And this will leave Robert Fulton to succeed finally with the idea. Now here's another interesting guy from American history. You may have heard of him, his name is Oliver Evans. He was an American inventor, engineer, and businessman. And he was one of the first Americans building steam engines and was an advocate, unlike Watts, of high pressure steam. Evans was one of the most prolific and influential inventors in the early years of the United States. But in any case, he received a patent for a steam engine in 1804 and set about looking for commercial applications to make some money. The first of his proposals, get this, was for the Lancaster Turnpike Company, Philadelphia Lancaster Turnpike Company. He proposed to construct a steam wagon with the capacity to carry 100 barrels of flour between Philadelphia and Lancaster in two days which by his estimation would greatly increase profits compared to the equivalent of five horse wagons for whom the trip took three days. With the company unsure of the reliability of this beast and the cost of the technology, the project was rejected. And despite this setback, within a year, Evans found a new client. Philadelphia Board of Health was concerned about dredging up the Delaware, cleaning the city dockyards. So in 1805, he convinced them to contract him to develop a steam powered dredge, which we can see here. He would drive this through the streets of Philadelphia to get to wherever he needed to be. And we can learn some Latin tonight. I guess that's Oructor Amphibolos, basically uh, uh, an amphibious digger. Of course, the guy that gets all the credit, he's the one on the postage stamp. Pennsylvania Historical Museum Commission has a, a place property in Southern Lancaster County, Robert Fulton House. And he was, as we well know, an American engineer and inventor. And he's, widely credited with developing, and this is the key here, a commercially successful steamboat. The first was called the North River, and by the way, the North River is just the Hudson River, and it, it's called the North River for a long time, uh, but basically the North River was to distinguish it with the Dutch from the East River, and also the Southern River is basically a, in the Chesapeake and the Susquehanna. It was later called the Claremont, so in 1807 that steamboat traveled on the Hudson River, with passengers from New York City to Albany and back, a round trip of 300 miles in 62 hours. The success of his steamboat changed river traffic and trade on major American rivers, and it inaugurated the first profitable venture in steam navigation, carrying paying passengers between Albany and New York. Now, I know all of you out there have been waiting for the train stuff. This is just a start. I love this picture. It's actually from the Railroad Museum's collection. It was taken in 1848. It's thought to be one of the earliest pictures uh, in the United States of a, of a steam locomotive. It was built by Norris Brothers in Philadelphia. It was called the Tioga, as you can see there. And this was built for the Philadelphia and Columbia Radio, uh, Railroad. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's our American steam fix. We'll get more, but to continue really with steam locomotion, we need to go to England. And the guy in the picture there, I don't know how to pronounce his name. I'm gonna say Trevithick, it's just easier. But this guy here is actually a mining engineer and in 1801, if you look in the top right there, basically it's a weird drawing of a carriage to which he applies a steam engine. And he runs through town, a test run, and basically he gets the ball rolling with steam propulsion. Later that year, he created something called the Puffing Devil, or what they called Captain Dick's Puffer, based on the noise of the, the locomotive engine. And you can see that in the lower left. And he takes a bunch of friends for a ride through the town, and, and unlike the steam engine produced by Scotland and James Watt, Trevithick's used strong steam, or what we would call steam at very high pressure. He used 145 PSI, which was pretty high for that time, compared to Watt's engine, which only had 5 PSI. This actually enabled him to build a smaller engine that would fit in his puffer car. Pretty cool. Now, in 1808, Trevithick will become the father of steam locomotion when he sets up a demonstration of his third motive locomotive in a demonstration yard in London's Euston Square. He was called Catch Me Who Can. And I like that under the bottom there, it says mechanical power subduing animal speed. His new locomotive was able to travel at some 
12 miles an hour on the 100 foot diameter circular track. And he believed that 20 miles per hour would have been possible on a straight track. And he built a fence around it and he charged money. And of course, they didn't know how to do the tracks. And when it rained, the ground got soft and it sank. But anyway, he proved the successful technical feasibility of a steam locomotive running on railway tracks. Very significant. This is in 1808. Took another 20 years for the potential of this to be realized with the successful trials of some very important names, even in American railroading, George and Robert Stevenson, their locomotive rocket in 1929. Trevor Thick's work with high pressure steam locomotives truly makes him the father of all railroads. Let's go back to America. This man here, Colonel John Stevens, he's the father of American railroads. He achieved the title of Colonel while serving as a captain during the Revolutionary War. In 1812, talk about a guy with foresight, everyone's building turnpikes and canals. He published a pamphlet entitled, Documents Tending to Prove the Superior Advantage of Railways and Steam Carriages Over Canal Navigation. And he outlined many phases of railway transportation. And this is a cover of a modern, you can purchase this today. So if you're really bored, check it out. Or if you just want to learn what he was writing about. So Colonel John Stevens actually received the first railroad charter in the United States in New Jersey in 1815. Of course, nothing happens. He's got a charter, which is basically just an official document giving him permission to build a railroad, but nothing will happen until 1830. But that is a first for him. So he's truly a father of railroading. Now to prove and demonstrate the feasibility of railroads, in 1825, he built the first American steam locomotive, was never put into commercial service, however, and was only run on a half mile circular track on his estate in Hoboken. And you can see that there. He was able to achieve a speed of 12 miles per hour. Now Stevens locomotive aroused great public enthusiasm. And at the time of his death, railroads were under construction throughout the East. Now, one of the things I didn't understand at that time was the whole idea of traction. The, adhesion of the wheels on the track. So if you look carefully at this, and we do have a reproduction of this uh, at the Railroad Museum of Pennsylvania, but look in the middle there, you can see that cog wheel. And then in the middle of the, of the rails is another rail in which the teeth for the cog wheel are placed. So he's got another cog attached to the piston, which is behind the wheel at the left there. And it's going to cause the wheels to turn and the thing will go around. He also had, uh, there's some vertical piece of wood right behind the wheel to the left and right of the wheels that uh, had like a rubber roller on it that kept it on the tracks, but there was no flange. And you can see a bench in the back there. That's where the path, there's two benches in the back so passengers could ride on his demonstration and the barrel was for the water. And he may have had another court. And he actually had the, this, the boiler tubes, which was an upright boiler, which is not what we're used to seeing. Now in 1829, the Delaware and Hudson Canal began to investigate, actually in 1827, the use of the steam engine for traction and locomotive use on its gravity railroad to haul coal from its mines in Honesdale, Pennsylvania, and then by canal to New York City. In 1829, the Delaware and Hudson will run the Sturbridge Lion. This was the first imported locomotive from England, from a company in Sturbridge, appropriately enough. And while it performed well, this was a perfect example of the need to do your homework before you do something. The infrastructure of their tracks could not stand the weight of the locomotive. So after their trial run, you can see all the people there, American flag, very patriotic, we got this locomotive. They would just set it aside for about 20 years and then they'll use the steam engine on it to run mechanic machinery in their, their railroad. So I mentioned this very briefly because the company that will is formed, um, Robert Stevens and the company, they will basically get their really start. This was a trial of locomotives in Rainhill, which was a small village in England. And there were a bunch of people in this, this the railroad was trying to find a, a good locomotive and they offered a 500 pound prize. And the Stevensons win with their fake, famous locomotive, uh, the rocket. And you can see the rocket right there. And the technology that they use in the rocket in 1829 will become standard fare in locomotives, steam locomotives for, well, maybe not ever, but it just becomes part of future locomotives. And their company, uh, Steve, Robert Stevenson and Company, was the very first company in the world created specifically to build railway engines. Now, I was in Newcastle upon time, 
But at that time, I had no idea who Robert Stevenson was or anything about that. So I don't know if there's a museum there. I imagine there is. Now let's get back to America, down in Maryland to Baltimore. Here we see Charles Cowell and over to the right, President John Quincy Adams. Interestingly enough, on the same day as the B&O Railroad was started, the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal also started as well. It ran from Washington, D.C. to Cumberland. President John Quincy Adams, I guess he didn't like railroads, he will turn over the first spadeful of dirt for the canal on July 4th, 1828, while Charles Carroll of Carrollton, he was one of the last surviving signers of the Declaration of Independence, by the way, performed the groundbreaking for the Baltimore and Ohio by laying the first stone for the line. John Quincy looks pretty happy there, doesn't he? All right, uh, check out the railroad coach. Of course, in these days, all they knew were stage coaches, so a lot of their passenger cars were based on stage coaches. But what's interesting on this one is if you look up above here, you could sit up above under the canopy top. Uh, the logo there, of course, it has a lot to do with Washington. During the throes of the Industrial Revolution, the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad still ran on horsepower, literally. Although steam locomotives existed elsewhere, horses were hauling the B&O rail cars when the railroad launched in May of 1830. But the company's investors knew that only machines, not animal muscle, would be able to power trains over its planned 380-mile route between Baltimore and Wheeling, West Virginia. In 1830, investor and businessman Peter Cooper developed and built a small coal-burning steam locomotive that was suitable for the BNO's plan right away and track. He'll take a bunch of the directors out and go to Ellicott's Mill, and I guess he impressed them. Well, this might be more legend than fact, but the guy that built that locomotive was Peter Cooper there. You can see his picture there. I'm working on catching up to him on his beard, by the way. In any case, uh, <clears throat> there's a contest in 1830 you can see two sets of tracks there. Tom Thun was a pretty small locomotive, but they say, let's see who wins. We'll run a locomotive against a horse, both pulling a car. You can't see the car behind the horse. Well, guess what? Technical problems ensued, and the Tom Thun will not be able to complete the trip. But even though the horse wins, this does prove the efficacy and the, re the fact that steam locomotives are the way to go in the future. Now back to Pennsylvania. Actually, this is in New York, I apologize. In New York, the Mohawk and Hudson Railroad, we have a man by the name of John B. Jervis. His middle name is Bloomfield. He designed a locomotive in 1832 called the Experiment. If you notice the wheels down below, there's four wheels in the front and they're in what is called a truck. And then you have wheels in the back. You can't see it, but the wheels in the back are the driving wheels and they're connected to the piston. But what he did was he will involve, invent the four wheels in front are actually on a swiveling truck. Now, America was always known for working on the cheap as far as like building railroads. So they couldn't get around a strict curve, they would have to live with it. And this truck here will allow more stability in navigating curves and turns and things like that. Also allow the train because it'll give it more stability to travel at faster speeds. All right, Robert Stevens. We have another railroad, an early American railroad. The Camden and Amboy was the first railroad to operate in New Jersey. And this map isn't that great, but if you look at a map today, do a route from Camden to Amboy, and you'll see the Amdip Boy is situated on a body of water. And from there, you know, you could obviously take a steam trip. But uh, this is the first uh, railroad to operate in New Jersey, and it was founded by uh, inventor, transportation pioneer John Stevens, who we saw earlier, and his sons. Robert and Edwin. Uh, while chartered by John in 1815, as we said, it only was created in 1830s, and it became known as the Camden Amboy Railroad and Transportation Company. And its purpose was basically to connect, as I said, Philadelphia and the Delaware with Philadelphia, uh, New York, uh, basically the Raritan River, and you take a steamboat from there. Now, Robert Stevens, the son, he's on his way to England because they're the railroad masters, and he's gonna check out their railroads he wants to buy some rail, and he also wants to buy a locomotive, which he does do from the Stevensons. Remember them in Newcastle? While he's crossing the Atlantic, he's whittling a piece of wood, and he comes up with the design of the standard T-rail. This might be a legend, but I like the story, and we still use this design today. There are all kinds of rail styles. It's unbelievable. 
Uh, and by the way, we won't make our own T rail, so England was supplying them uh, until 1845. But if you look uh, at the top picture, this was an early form. It's called a strap rail. They have basically a piece of wood, and they would attach a, a strap to it to give the wood more durability as the, the cars would go over it and eventually locomotives. These straps were notoriously, they were notorious for coming loose and causing derailments. Uh, at the bottom there, it might be hard to see, but we have an L-shaped wheel. So the wheels are, you know, basically kept in place by the, the upright, the vertical portion of the track rail. And then the early way of doing was with stone sleepers, if you look in the upper right. And the reason they did it this way, as opposed to the way that we're normally used to, uh, is because you have horses in mines in England pulling these cars. Even without locomotives, you've got horses pulling these cars, so they don't want to have anything that they can stumble on. So in the picture below, this is actually from an, a display that we have at the museum. You can si kind of see the tradition from the stone sleepers and rails to the wooden ties and rails that we use today with stone ballast and that type of thing. So what do they get in, in, well, first off, before I get ahead of myself, the locomotive that they will buy from Mr. Stephenson is called the John Bull. And I don't know if you ever heard of John Bull, but I've talked to people from England that don't know who he is, but he is basically a fictional character to, person, to personify the in country of uh, Great Britain, you know, Great Britain. Uh, so he's like our Uncle Sam. So here is the John Bull locomotive. Um, having never seen a locomotive before, Camden and Amboy engineer Isaac Gritz, who was a young steamboat mechanic, assembled this engine from the parts that arrived in New Jersey in 1831. Steam locomotive John Bull ran for 35 years. As we said, it was going between Camden and Amboy, and they will, of course, branch out. It was retired in 1866, and when the Pennsylvania Railroad acquires the Camden and Amboy in 1871, they also got the John Bull. Now, we have a replica of the John Bull at the museum, and uh, the original is on display in the Smithsonian Institute, and it's the oldest existing locomotive in the United States. Now, I just had to get this in here. As I said before, I try to figure out what people saw through their eyes in the time period, because I can't do that. But there was a TV show on PBS uh, about Queen Victoria, and she will be the first monarch to ride uh, the train in England in 1842. Her husband, Albert, was German. He was into technology and doing things for the future, and they go traveling somewhere, and he sneaks off, because Victoria isn't really keen about this. She doesn't understand why he's so excited. And uh, he sneaks off and rides on a train and he freaks out. He comes back and tells her, and she doesn't give in that she's also excited, but she sneaks off on her own as well. And she takes a train ride. And the actress who did this, I can't remember her name, but the thing to me as a historian, someone who's interested in the people of the past, this girl who plays Victoria in her face shows what the feeling must have been like to ride on a train for the very first time. And I'll tell you what. I found it very emotional because she personified something that I've imagined and wondered about. If you don't see Victoria for the series, watch that episode. I think it's the third episode in season one. But it was amazing, I'm telling you. All right, now let's get back. In 1825, we have the Erie Canal. What's Pennsylvania going to do to catch up now that New York City is the center of finance and commerce? They will suggest something called the Main Line of Public Works. It not only enabled the carrying of heavier loads than those carried by Conestoga wagons over existing roads, but it also decreased the time necessary for a cross-state trip from about 23 days by freight wagon to four and a half days. Now that was with a horse. The introduction of steam locomotives shortened the trip to only three and a half days. So as I said, during the 1820s, seeking to compete with New York and Baltimore in tapping Western markets, Business and political leaders in Philadelphia pushed for a state-funded canal to link Philadelphia with Pittsburgh. The result, an innovative yet peculiar patchwork of canals and railways known as the main line of public works succeeded in moving freight and passengers across the mountains middle of Pennsylvania. The 395 mile system reduced travel time and spurred growth of towns and market act, uh, activity along the line. However, within three decades, it was out of business having been purchased and superseded by the Pennsylvania Railroad in 1857. The main line consisted of starting in Philadelphia there. We have an 86-mile double-track railroad, very unusual in that time period, from Philadelphia to Columbia, 
uh, it was actually the very first double track railroad in the world. And uh, horsepower was used, as I said in the beginning, uh, which caused it to last longer. And also individuals, if they had a car that would fit on the tracks, they could, they could use the track themselves as well. But finally they banned horses in 1844. Uh, then next we see from Columbia, there was an incline at Columbia that took the trains down to uh, the Susquehanna River and it went up the Susquehanna to the Juniata for a 172 mile canal ride. And then we have the 37 mile long Allegheny Portage Railroad. And there were 10 inclined planes, five on each side of the mountains to get you over the Allegheny Mountains to Johnstown. And then we have the Western Division Canal to Pittsburgh. Now, th there was an account written by a guy named William Hassel Wilson. And his father was one of the ones that surveyed the right of way for the Philadelphia and Columbia Railroad in 1827 and 28. And William wrote a small book called Reminiscences of a Railroad Engineer. Wilson and his fellow engineers in their wildest dreams could not have anticipated the way that railroading would take off. They were just starting one of the first runs in Pennsylvania. They envisioned horse-drawn cars running along the tracks, taking the better part of the day to get between Philadelphia and Columbia. Just for comparison, about 75 years later, the Pennsylvania Railroad's Pennsylvania Special would make the over 900 mile run from New York to Chicago in 20 hours. Now from his account, he writes this. In March, 1828, an act was passed authorizing the location and construction of a railroad from Philadelphia to Columbia. There was so much jelly in re jealousy in regard to the distribution of appropriations of money by the state that it was impossible to get an appropriation through the legislature for any one piece of work without including others of doubtful utility. Something else you needed money for, let's tack that on. Hence, instead of prosecuting one section of a railroad or canal with vigor and bring it into use, work was started in spots all over the state and in some cases never completed nor made productive. The Lancaster County people feared that if the railroad was prosecuted from the east, the money might be exhausted before it ever reached them. And they were talking to farmers along the way and they were all standing around with their brakes and chewing their straw and there's, I ain't gonna work, you know, it's just gonna ruin things, blah, blah, you know, some things never change. All right, the train started at uh, Broad and Vine Streets and they had these combination cars. Uh, they were both canal boats and they were able to be transported on, on wheels. So horses uh, uh, would pull the, through uh, Philadelphia from uh, Broad and Vine Street and they would come to, uh, a bridge across the Schuylkill River. And then we have something called uh, the Belmont Plain, uh, the Belmont Incline. And here, uh, the, they would pull them up this incline plain. And then in the beginning, uh, horses would continue to Columbia. And then from that point on afterwards, they would use steam locomotion. And it might be hard for you to see the map, but the lower circle in red uh, is the bridge that you can see the covered bridge in the back there. And then you can see the incline plain indicated on there. And anyway, pretty amazing stuff. Uh, when the train reached Columbia, the, uh, there was a subsequent incline plane, as I said before, to get down to the Susquehanna. And then at Hollidaysburg, there were subsequent incline planes. And here's the, you can see the, the, the cars there on, on the uh, car there being pulled up. Now, we all know in Lancaster County, Thaddeus Stevens, if you saw the movie Lincoln, you saw Tommy Lee Jones doing an excellent, what well, I think, impersonation of him. But... Our man, Thaddeus Stevens, earned a place in American history as a prickly debater. He was a staunch abolitionist and champion of free education. He was less known as a railroad magnate and because, perhaps because of his foray into that arena was such a remarkable failure and a stain on his reputation as a great public servant. He was a state legislator from 1833 to 1841 and he saw the main line of public works as an opportunity to benefit his own businesses in Adams County, which among them was an iron furnace and elsewhere. He proposed a branch line from Philadelphia and Columbia Railroad through York County and Gettysburg and Maryland through his properties. He persuaded the PA legislature to appropriate funds for this railroad. While it was still under construction, critics complained of graft and patronage that lined the pockets of contractors. The negative publicity did not present Stevens from political advancement as he was appointed in 1838 by Governor Rittner as president of the state canal commissioner. So he was able to control things from the, for his railroad as he pleased, rewarding supporters and demanding kickbacks from contractors. It became a political issue in the 1838 elections. It was a very turbulent election and 
the expensive tape work became a campaign issue. When Governor Rittner lost his bid for re-election to the Democratic candidate David Porter by fewer than 5,500 votes, Stevens and his party refused to acknowledge the results. Huh, imagine that. In the resulting buckshot war, Rittner called out buckshot armed militia to put down a riot of armed thugs from Philadelphia who had marched on the state house in Harrisburg. And this forced Stevens and his supporters to jump out a window to escape. Again, that might be more legend. I found this picture as well, and I just found it amazing because we know that Fatty Stevens was um, a, a staunch and fiery abolitionist. And here we see him lying in state in the Capitol's rotunda. And this warranted a cover on Harper's Weekly. Um, a accompanying article noted, uh, noted that more than 5,000 people came to view his coffin, which was watched over by Butler's Wolves, an African-American military organization named for another noted abolition and representative, Benjamin Butler. All right, it's eight o'clock. Do we continue? Do you need to go? I'm almost done, but it's gonna take about maybe 10 more minutes. Do you wanna stick around? I'm gonna just go, if you need to go on, please do. All right, the Horseshoe Curve, which was an engineering marvel, was opened in 1854 and was engineered by Jed Gertomkin Thompson. He will become a president of the Pennsylvania Railroad later. The length of this curve is 2,375 feet, and the grade is 1.8%. And even a grade of 1% is gonna be nasty for a railroad, so that they were able to keep it that low is pretty amazing. And so that's 1.8 foot rise over 100 feet. Let's recap. Wagon transportation from Philadelphia to Pittsburgh took over 20 days. In 1834, with the opening of the main line, the same trip via the main line of public works took about four days when the canals weren't frozen, which is something we didn't mention. By 1852, trains could cross the state, but they were still dependent on the Allegheny Portage Railroad, which didn't operate at night, by the way. With the addition of the Horseshoe Curve in 1854, the Pennsylvania Railroad Institute and all train service from Philadelphia to Pittsburgh, this took 13 hours instead of three and a half days on the main line. There were 450 workers who worked on it, and many of them came from Ireland. And the work was done entirely by hand, and workers were paid 25 cents an hour, or three dollars for the whole day. And the average daily wage in Pennsylvania, wage in Pennsylvania at the time was 95 cents, and that would have been probably a, at least a 10 or a 12 hour day. As dynamite had not been yet invented, and that'll come in 1866, they had to use black powder, picks, axes, shovels, wheelbarrows, horses, and drags. Abraham Lincoln in 1862 will sign the Pacific Railroad Acts. The Central Pacific and the Union Pacific Railroad companies will be building a transcontinental railroad that would link the United States from east to west. Over the next seven years, the two companies would race towards each other from Sacramento, California on the one side to Omaha, Nebraska on the other, struggling against great risks and dangers before they met at Promontory, Utah on May 10th, 1869. And we did sell it, well, the, the Postal Service came out with special stamps last year. I love this picture here. Uh, it was taken by Andrew Russell. It's a famous photograph of East and West shaking hands at laying on the last rail on May 10th. Now, before the building of the Transcontinental Railroad, it cost nearly $1,000. And again, using my inflation genie, that's about $29,000 today. Unbelievable. To travel across the country. After the railroad, the Transcontinental Railroad was completed, the price dropped to $150. Well, with the completion of the track, the travel time for making the 3,000 mile journey across the United States was cut from a matter of months to under a week. Well, let's check that out. I was lucky to find in a Time Life book, I couldn't believe it, I've been wondering about this for the longest time, I found this poster right here. San Francisco to New York, six days and 20 hours. Now you probably can't see the prices listed on the left there, but first class from San Francisco to New York was $10 less than the price they said before, I said before, $140. That's about $2,900 today. Second class from San Francisco to New York was $110, that's about $2,250. And both of these first and second class took six days and 20 hours. And then there was something called a mixed immigrant class, which cost $75. Uh, 
about $1,500 today. And that, that took 11 days. So you had to take the slow route for that. Now the picture on the right here is a famous Kepler uh, political cartoon. You can see, uh, I don't know who they are, but there's a whole bunch of folks that were involved with the Transcontinental Railroad. And basically uh, you see uh, Uncle Sam in the middle, he's got a, a sword there uh, which, on which it says public opinion. And uh, in 1872, the New York Sun exposed the Credit Mobile scandal. It was a sham construction company chartered to build the Union Pacific Railroad by financing it with unmarketable bonds. It also provided a mechanism to dispense the immense profits from building the railroad to the boards and directors and its shareholders. This was a massive scam. Political uh, senators were involved, many officials were involved. Even the vice president at the time, Schuler Colfax, had purchased some of this stock, but got rid of it so he didn't get into trouble. It's just amazing. All right, I think we're getting close to the end here. Now, working on railroads is to this day a dangerous profession, but in the 19th century, it was particularly dangerous. If you look at the left, you can see a brakeman. He's, there's another brakeman in the back there. And the only way to stop a train was to turn the brake wheels by hand. They're called hand brakes. And when the whistle, the whistle would be sounded, the brakeman would run across the top of the car, turn the brake wheel, run to the next one, turn that brake wheel. So we have a slow progression of brakes, slowly slowing the train down the engineer who doesn't have generally a brake on his locomotive is kind of cut back on the steam, of course. So if you have one man, he might be responsible for three or four cars. That's going to limit the length of your train and what a train can pull because you need a brakeman for each set of cars. The other thing that was dangerous was the way that cars were coupled. And in the beginning, they used chains, if you can believe it. But through most of the 19th century, they had something called a link and pin. And in the middle picture, you can very clearly see the pin and the oblong piece is called the link. And in the picture to the right, you can see a, a railroad worker standing in the middle. He's holding a pin in his right hand. He's already got the link in the other one, or maybe it was already inserted. The guy in the back is signaling the engineer to, to back up the car until he can get the other pin in. Well, two things will happen. George Wessinghouse will develop something to change life for railroaders forever. He will invent something called the automatic air brake in 1872. Now there are variations of this brake before that, but if you were to go into a locomotive today, even if you didn't know what else you were looking at, you would be able to pick out the hand brake. They still look very similar to the picture that you see here from 1872. And in the picture to the right, you can see the couplers. And basically there's a rod on the side of the car. You lift that up and the, the cars come apart and they're open then. And then when they come together, they automatically close. And if you look at the pipes above and below the couplers, those are the brake, the automatic air brake lines. So Eli Janney basically creates the knuckle coupler, by the way. And in 1893, the federal government will enact what's called the Railway Safety Appliance Act. And it's one of the first times that the federal government will step into railroad business. And they basically mandate these automatic couplers, these Janney couplers, there were other brands, and air brakes, automatic air brakes, to be installed on all cars. The government gave a seven-year grace period to have all vehicles converted. While the wealthy Pennsylvania Railroad had the conversion completed by February of 1894, many railroads needed an extension of the time, and there were quite sufficient substantial fines for noncompliance. Still okay? Let's talk a little bit about how trains worked. And a friend of mine, Randy, gave me this quote here from Thoreau. I just love it. It should be part of every man's education today to understand the steam engine. What right does a man have to ride in the cars who doesn't know by which means it is moved? All right, this is a typical steam locomotive, 1873. If you look at the wheel configuration, there's two of those pilot wheels in the front, and we have four driving wheels in the back. This was one of the most common passenger locomotives through the last half of the 19th century and even through the beginning of the 20th century. It was called an American class for that reason. They were very common, very popular, and they're called a 440. This particular car was built in the picture by the Baldwin Locomotive Work in, Works in Philadelphia. So starting at the left, you can see the tender. Of course, uh, while a lot of railroads are switching to coal by this time, a lot were still using wood. So we can see wood piled up in the tender. There's also a water tank in there, and if you look between the locomotive and the tender, right by the little wheels under the tender, you can see a, a, a tube there, like a pipe, and that's uh, allowing the water to come 
gravity feed down into the pipe and then they'll put it into the boiler, of course. Uh, continuing to the right, you can see the locomotive cab. Uh, the engineer and the fireman will be working in there. Above the boiler, which is the gray middle section of the locomotive, we have something called a steam dome. In early locomotives, because the water was at such high pressure and boiling and bubbling and gurgling, they would oftentimes get steam water into the piston. This is called priming or carryover. And you can, you can just throw a piston rod if you get water in your piston. So what they will do is they will create a dome. Now the steam is like collecting on top of the boiler, but if there's any water there, this allowed the steam to have a place. And in that steam dome is where the throttle will release steam down into the pistons. Uh, since the steam is there to begin with, we can see a whistle. Just to the right of the whistle is a pressure purge valve. If the pressure got too high, that would automatically go off. Basically, we have steel wheels on steel rails. This is perfect from a standpoint of friction and moving things because there's no friction. But what if the track is wet? I was watching a movie the other day. It was a, a World War II movie in France, and it, it was, I think it was called The Train. And when they're starting the one train, the wheels are just slipping and turning around. And what an engineer would have to do was let sand from the sand dome. And if you look, you can see right here, if you can see my mouse, this pipe here, it goes down here, and then you can see right here, where does it go? Right in front of the drive wheel. So that sand will give the train some traction. And you know, the, the problem is still too true today. We have sand on locomotives today. You just don't have a, a big dome like that on top of it. Uh, obviously in front of that, the bell, I can't remember right now, but the whistle is used for certain types of move and the bells is for another. Being a smoke or a, a, a wood burner, look at that huge smokestack there. And, Actually, the smokestack is pretty small, and what you see there, it was called like a balloon stack, and it's basically a spark arrester to try to keep all the sparks from the burning wood from going out and ruining things on the train, ruining your clothes if you're past, you're setting things on fire. Now that little picture with my face and it is in the way, but in front of the smokestack is a headlight. Uh, what we commonly call a cow catcher is technically a pilot, and basically in these days, it truly was to move things out of the track Again, we see the pilot wheels. Between the two pilot wheels is what's called the steam chest. In the middle there, we see a reverse gear. It's kind of hard to see. There's an air compressor for the brakes and for other things that use compressed air. So those are basically the parts. Again, the 440 was a passenger car. Here we have, from the same time period, what's called a mogul class. Since Passenger trains were going faster, even in this time period, they may have been going upwards of 60 or 70 miles an hour. Steam locomotives may have been going, or uh, freight locomotives may have been going 15 or 20 miles an hour at the most. They were going very slowly. They only needed two of the wheels in the front. Again, more wheels, more stability, higher speeds possible. We're going slow, so it's just going to help me on curves and that type of thing. We have six driving wheels. The wheels are also smaller. We get more what's called tractive force. Uh, to allow us to pull heavier loads. And this was part of the Bonanza Railroad, the Virginia and Truckee uh, Railroad. We have the oldest locomotive in our collection was part of the Virginia and Truckee, but it was built in Pennsylvania. All right, this is where all the action happens in the locomotive. It's called the backhead. There's a lot of stuff going on there. Uh, the main thing I want you to look at is this hole right here. This is the firebox. And this piece on the bottom and the top and the bottom here and the top here are the doors for that. And there's a, a foot pedal right down here and an pneumatic that will allow them to open it. And right where I'm standing, there'd be a big pile of coal. And on a class locomotive like this in 1906, the fireman could be shoveling a ton to a ton and a half of coal in an hour. So let me tell you, he's working his you know what off. And he's paying his dues. He wants to sit in the right seat, which is the engineer's seat, but he's gonna have to do a lot of work. And you know, the engineer might help out if he wants, but He's also, if he's smart and doesn't want to shovel coal the rest of his life, he's going to learn how to run the locomotive from the engineer. So a little training on the side. Up in the top left here, lubrication is, of course, essential. What we have here is a hydrostatic lubricator. Water was in, induced into the lubricator at a, a, a certain time interval to release drops of oil to lubricate various parts of the locomotive. All right, that doorway or that opening that I showed you in the back head, this is what's called the firebox. And one of the things over time that they'll discover is by making the, the, the grate area in the bottom here bigger, we can get more power because we'll have more heat. We can make the firebox bigger, greater heating surface. It's amazing how they learn over time. This is a relatively small firebox, 
from a, a consolidation class locomotive in our collection. Uh, the top of the firebox is called the crown sheet. Of course, you got your sidewalls. These tubes here are carrying through a draft that's created by the locomotive, the hot air through the boiler. And surrounding those tubes, of course, is water. And as that hot air is going through there, it's going to cause the water to get hot. It'll turn to steam, and we're happy. Now, fire, whether it's wood or coal, will create ash. And the bottom there is a grate, and there's shakers that you would use and attach it to the grate on the bottom. And you could shake the ashes and the coals out at the end of the day, or if it was a way that you were trying to control the fire. All right, over time, they get a little bit smarter. This is much bigger. You might be able to notice. But what we have here, uh, these pipes here are called siphons. They actually are connected to the boiler water on the inside, and water flows through there. So it's just another way of getting more water heated. But what we see is we see some big tubes here, and they'll start doing what's called superheating. And they take the steam that's produced by the locomotive, which is a very wet steam, and they recycle it back through these larger tubes to reheat it. This will make it drier, give you more volume, more expansion power. We have much more uh, efficient use. We can save fuel, coal, and water, or wood. One of the things they also wanted to do is if you're going to put coal in here, you want to make sure that all of it burns up, that you're not wasting coal. So by allowing the, get the coal to burn more, by having an arch, it forces the gases to travel over it and more complete combustion. So these brick arches with fire bricks would cause that to happen, and then the hot air would go through the tubes that you can see here. This is from an E7 class Atlantic locomotive from 1902. All right, so in this we have the boiler. Behind the boiler to the left is where the firebox would be. By the way, this entire area here where the boiler is and around the firebox is filled with water. And one of the things you were constantly monitoring on your locomotive was the level of the water. There were two ways to do it. It was so important. Now, keep in mind, the level of the water is going to stay the same. But if the locomotive goes up a hill, the water level is going to stay the same. But that might mean that something in the train will be exposed. And you did not want the crown sheet to be exposed. Since the water is under pressure, it's boiling at such a high temperature, should there be a leak back to nat normal atmospheric pressure, we have an automatic explosion. So it, it was just something that you had to be very, very careful about. Now, there's the steam dome that I mentioned. You can see that connecting piece right there that goes to the throttle and the cab. And then the, the steam will be released through the dry pipe. This is the superheater header here that goes back into the pipes again. And then we come down through these pipes here and eventually to the pistons. The smoke box is at the very front, and this is where the exhaust takes place. Basically, the piston, this is basically the, where you see the piston here. This is actually, if you want to get specific, I don't think I'm mistaken here, this is actually the engine of the locomotive. This is where the work takes place. And above it, this is how we let the steam go in and out. And on the left side here, we have what's called a C uh, valve or a clam valve. And on the right, we have a piston valve. And they'll find in later years that we're down to, oh, still got people here. That's good. Uh, we go to a piston valve. It was much more efficient. So the steam comes in, causes it to go. Then it goes out as the clamshell moves back and forth. And it's just a cycle that you can just imagine. And we have input and exhaust, piston going back and forth. Um, they will also find over time that making the diameters of the cylinders larger that we can increase the power of the locomotive. There's some amazing technology here. You know what, that's it. Thanks for hanging in, I'm 20 minutes late. I hope that was okay. All right, is anyone in the mood for some questions? Well, thank you very much, Craig. Uh, I, we have at the moment one question, and this actually goes back really early in your talk. Uh, Mike Weber asked if there was any established connection between Cornwall Furnace and the effort of Cloister. So this is drawing on your, your uh, effort and knowledge, and I, I think I have a thought or two about this as well. I have no thoughts. No, that's a very good question. It, it is a very good question. Of course, 322, uh, one of the reasons why it was laid out in the route that it was was to come right here to Cornwall. It went through, of course, effort as well. So any and all material that was traveling uh, eastward through Philadelphia from Cornwall went, you know, right past effort or right past the cloister as well. Uh, the one thing I'm not familiar with is I know that, of course, there were uh, 
use of jam stoves at Ephrata. Uh, but I don't know if they were jam stoves from Cornwall, if they were uh, cast elsewhere. That's something I'll have to, to talk to Carrie Moan about to see what exactly the, uh, uh, what furnaces uh, cast the, the plates that are there. And I don't exactly know how many uh, original plates there are. So uh, that was a good question, Mike, but uh, that, that one's gonna take a little bit more research. I also have to talk to uh, Michael Showalter, see if he uh, could illuminate us anything for that. So I do know we have a, a, a cast iron stove in what's called the doctor's house. I think it was in 1756 and a guy named Samuel Flowers, if I'm not mistaken. So I don't think he had anything to do with Cornwall. And I'm not no, sure that's, that that's, a, that's another early name, but a little bit further east. So uh, that appears to be all the questions, Craig. I know you have a lot of people uh, in the chat that are saying thank you and everything. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and uh, wind the talk. So uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us uh, for this lecture. I especially want to thank Craig Benner. Uh, for his presentation and for Kathy Donaldson uh, for helping to organize our virtual talk. I also want to thank the Friends of the Cornwall Iron Furnace who sponsored this program. If you or your business would like to sponsor a future lecture, please contact the site for further information. And of course, donations are always gladly accepted. Uh, I also hope that you can join us next month for our November 10th lecture, American Iron and Steel and the Strike of 1902, uh, by the uh, Cornwall Iron Furnace Associates President, uh, Jim Paul uh, We also have a talk coming up in December on uh, Cornwall uh, oral histories that uh, Brett Ray is doing. And the date of that is on the 9th of December. Sorry, I had to cheat a little bit, look at my calendar. So those are some of our upcoming events and we're also working on our schedule for next year. So uh, we look forward to the day when you can all come and visit the museum again. Uh, in the meantime, uh, please stay safe and uh, good night. Thank you everyone for joining us for the talk. Thank you for hanging in there. I appreciate it. I could have talked another hour, but you'd all be asleep. So thank you. <laughs>